Amen. Well, it's great to be here today. Am I on? Yes, I am. Okay, good. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, to look, continue our ser walk through the book of John. Today we're in John 18. Uh, you can turn there. And uh, we'll get the slide thing going in a minute. But um, I was just thinking about, as I was sitting here through the service, uh, how much I appreciate the church that we get to be a part of. Amen. And uh, I don't think you could go anywhere in the valley and find more messed up <laughs> and forgiven people than right here. Yep. I bet you never heard a communion like that before. Uh, I do appreciate, Chris, your openness and your realness. And uh, if you were out there thinking, well, I can't believe that that guy is saying that at church. You know, most people, they just don't say it. They don't talk about what's really going on. And if you're without sin, you can be the one to throw the first stone at our brother Chris. Uh, I've played football in college, and I've had that happen to me a number of times. And you just kind of wonder, wow, I need to get close to God. Anybody in here can decide today whether we're going to stay close to God and make it to heaven, or whether we're going to walk away, slowly fade away, and go the other way. And I appreciate the realness here. Even Javi sharing about his uh, sin and new convictions, thanks to his bride and the Holy Spirit. And God is so patient with us. It's amazing. And today the title is Not of This World. You can be turning into uh, John 18. That's a famous bumper sticker. You've probably seen it all over the place. And, uh, you know, sometimes the religious world, they come up with certain things and it just kind of drives me crazy because it's not real. But this one is actually a good one. Not of this world. That was Jesus. That's the way he lived his life. And I love this, pat, this uh, picture. What happened? My home is in heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. That's what God, that's how God wants us to feel as we go through this life, that I'm a stranger here. That I'm not, I don't want to be here for too long because I want to go somewhere better. I want to go somewhere else. And if you can remember this next slide, you will get the entire gist of what I'm trying to say today. If you're a Christian, you are not a citizen of this world trying to get to heaven. You're a citizen of heaven making your way through this world. Amen. I hope that you feel like a stranger in this world. I hope that you're not so comfortable in this world that you're not making a home in another world. Or if you are, I hope that today will help you to realize the world that's the most important is not the one that we can see right now. But in the end, that's the only world that's going to matter. And uh, as we get started here, uh, some of you know my son and I went on a little hunting trip. Here we go. That's us. Uh, as we went up, we drove up to Idaho, uh, 18 hours total. And uh, it was an amazing time. Uh, I got in trouble, though, with my wife because I took a grand total of three pictures. <laughs> There's picture number one. Uh, you know... Probably could have done that a little better, but uh, she's like, only three pictures. These great memories you're making. This was another one. If you noticed, it was kind of through the window of the car there. You get a little. <laughs> well, you know, it happens. That was pretty awesome. So you just picture this expanse. In, every, in 50 miles of everywhere that you can see. I mean, it was just, we were out in nature. And, uh, you know, we had no running water, no bathrooms, no electricity to charge my phone up, so it died. That's why I only got three pictures. Uh, anybody ever been camping? Anybody ever been camping with no water, no bathrooms, nothing? 
You feel my pain. You know, we were a little bit step up because other than the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that I probably would have brought, we had actually hot meals because the guy we were with planned ahead and heated up some really nice uh, meals there. Uh, but uh, we were out in the wilderness every morning from 6.30 in the morning until 8.30 at night. 14 hours out in the wilderness. Why were we out there for so long? Because it was like so long of a walk uphill back to the camp that we didn't want to do that twice. So we just stayed out all day. We walked like 15 to, or 10 to 20 miles a day. And it was something, something that I realized was that it is very hard to be spiritual. That was my grand lesson for the trip. <laughs> it's very hard to be spiritual when you're frustrated, when you got bees around, when it's hot, when you're not seeing any deer, when you're trying to see some deer, when your son's bugging you. <laughs> And so I was like this person conflicted. I was, you know, just frustrated out of my mind sometimes. And then other times, as I was out waiting, I would see these shooting stars and just feel like, wow, what a gift. I get to be here. Yeah. And I have moments and I'm walking, my son's in front of me, and I start kind of tearing up and like, wow, he's going to remember this forever. What a memory. And so I kind of was going back and forth between those extremes. <laughs> you know, I'm frustrated out of my mind, and then I'm, you know, wanting to, like, kill my son at one point. And, <laughs> and another time, I'm, like, tearing up, just, like, feeling so close to God. And I read Psalm 40, and I just felt like, wow, God, this is amazing. I have this little tiny Bible that I just jammed in my backpack. And, you know, sometimes it's not easy to be spiritual. Right. Most times. We're not at church most times, if you haven't figured that out. <laughs> and I had this inner battle going on this whole, the whole trip. Like, wow, why am I you know, so unspiritual? You know, I'm supposed to be a minister, and I'm just so... Un you know, I'm, these guys, they got out in front of us to our hunting spot one day, and I just was so competitive. I'm like, man, they beat us to the spot, and just so unspiritual. And, it, and I, I realized, you know, when you're fighting spiritually, that's a good thing. You know, when you're fighting against your unspiritual nature, that's a good thing. Now, there's a few people that are just like naturally spiritual, and they're just like searching out all the religions of the world to try to find the truth. That wasn't me. And it probably wasn't most of you. And so sometimes on those days when you feel less spiritual and you're fighting and it's a struggle to read your Bible and it's a struggle to call people and you just feel like, man, I, what am I doing? In some ways, I feel like God is looking down and saying, you know what, you're fighting the fight. Amen. You're aware of all of your weaknesses. You're aware of how short you fall before me and how much you need my grace. And I think in God's eyes, that's probably a lot better than the person that feels like they're so spiritual and they're so strong and they're so awesome and they've been a Christian for however many years and they converted however many people. You know, that sounds a lot more like an unspiritual person to me than the person who's fighting to be spiritual. And uh, this was the third picture. We got one. We got one. Even without getting one, it would have been a great trip. But God has a way on the final day, the day when my son was fidgety, moving, and I was all frustrated, we ended up getting two deer right, 10 minutes before we left. And that was some, just some great lessons for your son, right? We're, we're going to stay until 10 o'clock, even though we wanted to leave earlier. We're just finishing out our commitment. Our, it was just such an amazing, I was just like, God, you're amazing. You bless us even when we're so unspiritual. You overcome discouragement, obstacles, and all those things. And just to see the, the look on his face was, was worth it. And uh, we'll be having some uh, people over for some venison parties at some point, too. 
So I don't know how spiritual you're feeling today. Connor's looking pretty happy right there. De no este mundo. Not of this world. I pray that you don't waste your life living for something here that will be taken away someday. Living for something here that you can see that in the end you'll realize was a waste. You know, also when I was up in Idaho, there were some of my friends from college that were going up there for not such the same kind of event as we were. Uh, a buddy of mine named Dan Freeman died from cancer about three weeks ago. And he was having the funeral yesterday. And just thinking about all the things that we can have in this life, and then in a second, they're gone. And he was a super lovable guy, very nice, good guy. Everybody loved him, played the guitar, had an organic farm in Idaho. And yet now he's meeting God, wondering what kind of kingdom did he build. You know, I don't know what kind of kingdom he built. I know back in college he wasn't interested in building God's kingdom. Hopefully that changed over the years. But I pray that today you can take a sober look at your life as we go through uh, these passages in John 18, in verse 1. Sorry, kind of a long introduction here. It says, When he finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he went with his disciples to it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it that you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, struck, drew it and struck the high priest's servants, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So this is the situation. Jesus is going out to pray and he knows that this is his last night. And they come out to get him with swords and clubs and weapons. They were still fighting with the weapons of this world. Peter was there with his sword wanting to attack and protect the church, protect Jesus. Where was everyone else? They were running away. They weren't real spiritual either. You know, remember I t we talked about even the founding fathers of the church weren't real spiritual. Probably the, the most spiritual person just almost tried to kill somebody and missed. <laughs> because that was his kingdom. You're not taking away my kingdom. My king is right here and he's staying here. And Jesus said, well, are you going to take away my cup? Put your sword away because I'm not fighting for this world. And I love that. How Jesus says, I am he, and they just fall back on the ground. Yeah. You ever wonder that? When you, there's times when they wanted to kill Jesus, they brought him up on top of the hill to kill him, and he just says, he just walks through the crowd. and He just says his name, and they just fall back on the ground. Jesus had to contain all that power to be able to die for you and I. He could have opened it up and it would have, he would have been clear at any point. 
See, even Jesus had to choose which kingdom am I going to fight for? Am I going to fight for my father's kingdom or am I going to just fight for my friends here on this earth? For this life or for the next? Turn over to verse 33. Said Pilate, this is fast forward a little later. After Peter has denied Jesus once, they sneak into the court. They're warming himself by the fire. And as Jesus is in trial, Peter's there warming his hands because he's cold. Who's he thinking about? Himself. He's kind of thinking about Jesus. I mean, he's kind of there, but he's also wanting to stay warm. And he's standing there with the enemies that just arrested Jesus. He's not sure what he's going to do. And here's Jesus with Pilate. Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You're a king then, asked Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And next week we're going to talk about truth and just God's truth versus the world's truth as we have our Harvest Festival. But today we're going to focus on the first part. My kingdom is not of this world. One of the most misunderstood points about Jesus' ministry, they kept wanting to have a, a kingdom like David where they would kick out the Romans, where they would have a, an office and a government and they would have blessings and prosperity. They were looking for a high priest. And they were not looking for a savior that would be killed. Where is your kingdom? What, what kingdom are you fighting for? Are you fighting for your kingdom here on earth? Or are you fighting for a spiritual kingdom? And believe me, you know which one you're fighting for. If you're not sure if you're fighting, then you're not fighting. Because when you're in a war, you know you're in a war. When you're in a spiritual war, you know you're in a spiritual war. When you're going after this world, you know you're going after this world. But sometimes we can be confused. And we think we're building a spiritual kingdom when we're not. If you're confused, I would just encourage you to ask the people that know you the best. Ask your family members. Ask your best friends. Am I building a physical kingdom or am I building a spiritual kingdom? What do you think? That's a hard question to ask. But it's not that hard to answer. This world is not fair. And often fools, cowards, liars, and the selfish hide in high places. Those are the people that we try to please. The pilots of this world who wanted to pass the buck to somebody else, who didn't want to be responsible, who wanted to keep their jobs, the chief priest, more than stand up for the truth. Imagine if Jesus would have wanted to please them more than God. If he would have wanted to save himself Point number one, live for Jesus and his kingdom, not for myself and my kingdom. Amen. There can be only one king of my life. It's either King Jesus or it's King Scott. Either I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it, or I'm going to live my life the way God wants me to live it and go where he wants me to live. That's why Jesus said when he called his disciples, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself and come and follow me. 
Not live for myself, but live for King Jesus. You know, investing in prayer. I heard there was a great lesson on prayer last week. You know, when you're praying, you're investing in King Jesus' kingdom. You're saying, I can't do this on my own. I need help. I need miraculous intervention. When you're reading his word, you're saying, I need God's word to give me direction because I don't know which way to go. Amen. When you're trying to have a spiritual heart, that's also investing in the spiritual kingdom. But which king are you living for today? Jesus' kingdom was from above. How about money? Going after jobs and, and building wealth and having security and being the, with the goal of trying to rest and relax and have an easy life. If you're living for another world, you don't really get a restful, easy life. Because we're following Jesus. Look at his life. He gives us rest, but he doesn't give us too much rest. He gives us peace. He gives us joy in the midst of the storm. He doesn't necessarily take away the storm. Amen. Going after money, that can cost you your spiritual place in heaven. Approval. Approval. You know, we want so much to be liked by people in authority and people around us and our friends. I need a, a, a volunteer. Who would like to volunteer? Who can take it? Okay, how about you right there? What's your name? Okay, Christina, come down here. All right, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay, I want you to turn around and face everybody here. Okay, let's pretend for a minute that we all love Christina and she just did the most amazing thing in the world. Let's cheer for Christina. Okay. How'd that feel? Good. That felt pretty good. Okay, now let's pretend like we all don't like Christina and she just did something terrible. You guys weren't so enthusiastic with that. Give it to her. She said she could take it. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. Any one of us can give up our soul for that. Not just you, me too. If we care about people cheering for us and thinking that we're great, more than we care about what God thinks, we will trade in our soul. Why do you think the disciples left? Why do you think Peter denied? Because approval is a powerful thing. We can't deny it, but approval from God is a more powerful thing. Thank you, Christina. You're very brave. <laughs> Success. Because you too can have this face of pure accomplishment. <laughs> he looks like John Gruden. He's a football coach there that has that scowl on his face. Success. That can be a kingdom that we go after. Being a good person. I don't know why somebody would sit, take a picture with a sign that says that. I'm a good person. <laughs> but it seems like in today's world that that is like the most valuable thing you can be is a good person. Never stepping on anybody's toes, always in a good mood, always helpful. And when you read through the Bible, you see, wow, G what did Jesus say about a good... He said there's no one good except God. That's, that's a false sign, and that's a false sign that we try to wear. Yep. Why? Because we want people to cheer for us. Right. Yep. We want people to think we're great. It's hard to stand up. It's hard to take a stand like Jesus. You look through and you go, there wasn't a person, that was the one person in the New Testament that called Jesus a good person. 
There was a lot of people that didn't like Jesus because he wasn't afraid to stand up for God. He was loving, but he was confrontational. He spoke the truth in love. Let's not just try to be a good person in life. Amen. The kingdom of family, which is a really great thing to have a great family. But sometimes we can give up our spiritual priorities for our family. We can make excuses why we, we can't do spiritual things, why we can't make time for God because I have all these things going on with my family. Yep. Instead of, I'm so proud of the brothers in the church here that take a stand and say, I want to lead my family to heaven. I want to help them. That's the most important thing I can do for them. Whether Johnny wins a soccer game or whether they get a scholarship, for, that is the most ridiculous thing. I don't know how many parents, oh, my kid's going to get a scholarship. My kid this, my kid's going to get, you know, where I have all this coaches, training. There's a kid that spent like $3,000 to come back from an injury really fast. And I'm just like, that's your kingdom. That's what your, that's what your goal is, to be able to have your, not pay for college or be able to look at your son and, or your daughter. You realize how many people get hurt? Game over. Your kingdom will come down. It can happen at any moment. And then what will you do? If you're building a spiritual kingdom, you'll get through it. You'll be disappointed, but you'll get through it. Because all your hopes and your dreams aren't there. Your security, your, your worth is not in how well your kid does in their sport. Again, if you're a Christian... You are not a citizen of this world trying to get to heaven. You were a citizen of heaven making it through this world. I pray that today that you choose to break up with the world. I don't know if you've ever been broken up with before. Anybody? But you bunch of people aren't telling the truth. <laughs> I call you liars, and it's true. <laughs> Never been broken up. Wow, you're lucky. I mean, uh, most of us are like me. You can go through and tell you a, the, the, the lineup from fifth grade on of all the girls that yeah. broke up with you or said, you know, it, it's not you, but it's me. <laughs> That's a good person breaking up with you there. It's not you, it's me. Okay, well, I like you the way you are, but apparently you don't like me. I don't know. Um, it's ugly, right? Yeah. Breakups are ugly. Yeah. Zach and Vanessa broke up a while back. I don't know any of the details, so hopefully that was a good example. But when you break up, there's, it's not smooth, right? You can't just break up one day and then have lunch together the next. Text each other 10 times the day after you broke up. What is that called? That's called back together. That's not called broken up. <laughs> you know, uh, to break up with the world, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be pretty. If you are going after one of those things that I talked about earlier, it needs to be a hard breakup. I refuse to put this before God. I refuse to put relationships before God. I refuse to put my job before God. I refuse to continue to put my boss before God or, or put my family before God. I am never going to do that again. I'm done. And you can call me a thousand times, but I'm not going to pick up the phone. And you can give me, and Satan will give you opportunities to go back. And my prayer is that you will break up and you will do it with conviction. Amen. Yesterday we ran into a friend of ours at a football game and it was unexpected. And he was telling the story of his life. 
He played professional baseball for the Dodgers and got hurt. He made it to the Dodgers and busted up his knee before he even got a single at bat. That was his kingdom. He said he went on, and that was when he was 24. When he was 40, There we go. Is that better? So he prayed that God would lead him to a church that would teach him the Bible. And he was in a networking group, and one of the people in the group, it was a, he's a mortgage banker, and one, they were trying to get this one woman to join the group, and, and they, everybody really liked her. and said, man, she's really, she'd be a great part of the team. And, and she said, well, I'll only join the group if you come to church. He's like, that's kind of odd. That's a weird pickup line there. <laughs> or this girl's really serious. And so he came to church and he saw everybody taking notes and really loving God and he saw the diversity and he just started weeping. And they started getting together and after a few times he says, guys, I know we're getting together once a week and everything, but can we get together more? I mean, can we do this like four, four times a week? I mean, let's just... He said he was up till 3 in the morning reading the Bible. Because he was searching and he realized, what have I done with my life? Why did, why did I do this again and again and again? And here he was, five years later, still tearing up with how much God had saved him. Because he chose to break up with the world and live for God. I pray that today that you can truly say, you can find your worth in Jesus. Stop, stop advancing the slides. I'm finishing up here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that you can truly find your worth in Jesus, not in the things of this world. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.